Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from the Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? So I discovered that our Union City Rotary Club Pavilion stands at the southeast corner of the park, was modeled after the Blue Bank Roundhouse Pavilion at Real Foot Lake, and it was a popular hangout for teenagers in the 50s and 60s. That is fascinating. I I can only hope that someday it will become a popular hangout for teenagers (laughs) in the 20s. Yes. The 2020. Yeah. Um, I, I have a really fascinating guest to chat with today. Roy Heron is the, is a seventh generation Tennessean. He's a politician, attorney, author. He's the former chairman of the Tennessee Democratic Party. He was a Tennessee state senator for 16 years and a state representative for 10 years. He's a former Methodist minister, a professional speaker, a lawyer, a writer. We have so much to talk about. Welcome, Roy. Thank you so much, Scott. So what I what I'm you know I'm fascinated by history and of course the history of our area here in Northwest Tennessee. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, how your family helped settle Weekly County? You know, my mother used to tell us uh, when we were kids, tell us that our Gregory grandfather uh, was the first settler in Weekly County. And I, as I got older, I thought, well, mother probably doesn't have that exactly right. That's just kind of one of those family stories. And then I came across uh, an 1887 Goodspeed's History of Tennessee, an old volume that Mother had. And sure enough, there was a man named Reuben Edmonston, and uh, he and his brother-in-law uh, were the first settlers in Weekly County, what became Weekly County. Uh, even the Chickasaw uh, did not live in Weekly County at that time. It was a hunting ground. They came here, but they did not uh, have residence here. And so... Uh, the two of them came uh, and when they were very young men and uh, and settled here and uh, it, before they were legally supposed to be here and others followed and uh, uh, on it went from there. And uh, my family's been been here ever since. I tell Yankees uh, and friends from New York and Boston and places like that that uh, uh, we've intermarried so much that we're not smart enough to move off. And, the, and if I don't smile, they won't. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll buy into that. Uh, as my old friend Cotton Ivy used to say, uh, tourists and Yankees are easier to pick than Cotton and a lot more fun. And so sometimes I'll run that past them. But it, it apparently is true that the uh, my Gregory grandfather was uh, one of the first two people to settle here. Well, and we're going to talk about uh, Cotton Ivy some more in a few minutes. He just passed away recently, and I want to hear uh, your uh, memories and thoughts about him. But first, uh, tell me a little bit about growing up in Weekly County. Is that where your family stayed? And uh, tell me a little bit about your early years. Yeah, uh, on my mother's side, it goes back to 1819. On my father's side, uh, all of the uh, grandparents date back to before the Civil War. And uh, they've lived either in this county or next door uh, that that time. Uh, I was born in in Weekly County, raised up here. Uh, I was I had my birth parents, and then I had a a, a wonderful uh, group of folks who uh, were neighbors and church members and others who who uh, had a lot of parents. If I did if I messed up and did bad, it, there were a lot of folks that would jerk me back in line and and the word would get home before I would that I'd, I'd done uh, I needed to do better and uh, so I was blessed I it, it really was it was uh, it may have not been Andy of Mayberry but it was pretty doggone close and a dear friend of mine who uh, came and visited us one time uh, went back home and told her mother that she'd met Aunt B that that was my mother Aunt B uh, she just uh, mom would uh, was very very loving and uh, she loved us and she loved 
everybody else is chilling too. Uh, that's who she was. That's how she was raised. That was her faith and her tradition. Uh, her mother was a, uh, who died before I was born, but mom's mother was, uh, when she passed the, the uh, obituary listed her as an angel of mercy. She, uh, she was an unpaid social worker. Uh, and uh, she went all over town making sure that women who at that time gave birth in their homes, they had clean sheets to have the babies on and food to eat. And uh, uh, she saw my grandfather's job as making the living as a pharmacist and she'd spend it and try to help make sure that uh, everybody got by. That, that was the kind of background in the family, the deeply rooted in the church and in the traditions of the church that took Matthew 25 uh, very, very seriously, and that uh, we really are our brother's and sister's keeper. And so when the time came to go to uh, further your education, um, <laughs> was your family one that encouraged folks to go off to college, or did they generally just start farming right away? My, uh, my mother and father both went to UT Martin when it was a junior college. My sister went there. My younger brother later would go there. All three of my boys did part of their education there. That's where I went. If UT Martin had not accepted me to college, I don't guess I would have gone because it's the only place I ever thought about applying. And it is the only place I ever applied for undergrad. And, I, and it was a great blessing. Uh, there were wonderful people there. Phil Watkins is is still living, uh, but there were others like from Union City, Richard Chastain, and from Martin Ted Mosh and Larry McGee from Paris, and people in in the region who uh, they they blessed me, they nurtured me, they they were very very kind to me, and that opened up a lot of other doors. Uh, Phil Watkins and Larry McGee encouraged me to apply for a Rotary scholarship, uh, like those that are supported by the Rotary clubs of the region, and uh, that gave me the opportunity to go overseas to Scotland for a year. Uh, and, uh, but, but UT Martin was a, a wonderful place for me. And so that trip to Scotland, that must've been, uh, quite an inspiration for what happened with the rest of your life. No, it, it changed, uh, uh Larry McGee, uh, knew that, uh, uh, it would be a life changing experience for me and Phil did, Phil Watkins did, and, and they encouraged me to apply. And then when it worked out, when you apply for a Rotary scholarship, or at least when you did then, uh, you had to say what you wanted to study. And I was, I was digging deep enough into Scripture to know that uh, there was a lot I didn't understand, a lot I needed more I needed to know. And uh, I was, uh, I was hanging out with the uh, evangelical interdenominational group. I was hanging out at the Baptist Student Union. I was hanging out at the Methodist. Uh, uh, Wesley Foundation, which was uh, being ministered uh, uh, by a Methodist minister, but also to the Roman Catholics. So I was trying to learn from everybody. There was a lot I needed to know. So when I applied for the Rotary Scholarship, uh, I knew that I needed to dig deeper and I could either go to overseas and study law and I'd still have to come back and go to law school for three years, or uh, I could study New Testament and ethics, and that's what I chose to study. And it gave me a year to dig deeper. And, and then while I was over there, found out about the uh, joint program in Vanderbilt that let me study divinity and law. And I could come back and go to law school for three years. Or I could finish both degrees in four. So that was uh, that changed my life. UT Martin changed my life. The Rotary Scholarship changed my life. The opportunity in, at uh, St. Andrews in Scotland changed my life. And so you you uh, you were sort of going down uh, a dual path of both law and religion. Uh, do you see the two as separate, or are they intertwined? The further I dug into it, Scott, the more I realized that uh, uh, both were supposed to be about justice. Um, if you study the scriptures deeply, if you understand that the teachings of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, if you understand the 8th century prophets, uh, Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Micah, if you look at the teachings of Jesus uh, and indeed the teachings of Paul, uh, you realize you're supposed to be about justice and righteousness and certainly law at its noblest and best is about justice. Uh, both involve counseling people, uh, we call attorneys, uh, counselors sometimes, and certainly pastoral care and pastoral counseling is important. And both are supposed to be about peacemaking and uh, law done right uh, helps people come to peace and resolve conflicts. So uh, I saw them as I dug deeper 
as uh, complimentary. I, I'm a better lawyer because of the time I spent in the Benny School and in the church, I think. Uh, at least I hope I am, and I believe I am. Uh, and uh, certainly the insights I gained from practicing law were useful in many times as I was trying to work with folks of faith. So I'm going to um, ask you some more about that in a few minutes um, because I'm fascinated by you know the, the work that you've done and looking at it through the lens of where we are in both politics and religion today. And so we're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, what uh, was the inspiration for you to make the decision to run for political office? Uh, I grew up in a uh, uh, a bad family in a bad neighborhood. Uh, my uh, great uncle was a legislator, both in the House and in the state House and state Senate. Uh, he and my grandfather both were on the county commission or county court, as they called it then, for over 30 years. Uh, the I had relatives uh, a little bit more distant, but nonetheless relatives who'd been sheriffs uh, of the county. I had a, uh, a relative who was... Uh, uh, worked for the FBI. Uh, my father had been a judge uh, as well as a courthouse official. And so there was a tradition of public service. And, and I didn't know that uh, it, politics was supposed to be something uh, ugly or nasty. I, I thought it was the way you tried to love your neighbor as yourself. And then in the neighborhood in which I grew up in, literally, uh, as, as the late public service commissioner, Casey Pentecost, once said, what said, uh, he said a, a major league pitcher could stand in his uh, front yard and throw a baseball uh, in any direction. And, and within a, a baseball throw's reach uh, during the time he'd lived there and the time uh, my mother lived there, uh, we could identify five or six mayors, five or six judges, five or six state legislators, public service commissioner, speaker of the house of representatives, governor. And when uh, two U S senators came uh, to uh, Dresden to visit family, they came to that same house in that same yard. So uh, there was a tradition in the community of uh, trying to serve your neighbor and and trying to help people. And uh, so that's, I got pulled into that. I didn't expect to do that. I certainly didn't move that direction while I was in divinity school and law school. Uh, but when I got out and uh, I appreciated what then Speaker McWhorter had been doing, and when he decided to run for governor, uh, I, I, some friends encouraged me, some people uh, encouraged me to, to run for his house seat, and, and I did. What, what surprised you um, once you got into office? Um, and then, of course, you've had an incredible uh, career um, in that area. But what, what early surprises did you find that you didn't expect to find? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, when I first got to Nashville, uh, I was so uncomfortable with so many lobbyists. Uh, I just didn't know who I could trust and who I couldn't trust. And everybody, it seemed like, was representing a particular interest. And I wanted to be make sure I, I understood the, all the arguments from all the different corrections and both sides if there were uh, opposing parties. And, and what I realized, and I think this was a bit of a surprise, it was that actually the, the legislative system at that time, at least, worked pretty well when you had good advocates on both sides, when you had smart and honest lobbyists on both sides. And then we could sort it out. And for the most part, the General Assembly do something that moved us in a, uh, in a, in a pretty reasonable direction. But uh, what I found out was where the system really breaks down is where you've got a, a well-paid highly skilled, talented lobbyist on one side and uh, nothing but four or five, six million Tennesseans on the other side, nobody representing their interest. So that was that was a bit of a surprise after I got there. And that was at least uh, for good or for bad, right or wrong, that was where I felt my own particular calling was to make sure uh, that, that uh, the Tennesseans were represented and that we didn't just do what one particular interest group wanted. Yeah, there's it. There's a little bit of a throwback to uh, David Crockett there, who was also from this area um, and protected Tennesseans. He, uh, I, I've read more about Crockett with the years, and uh, going back to what we were talking about a minute ago, my mother said that uh, uh, 
Reuben Edmondson came into second only to David Crockett in bear killing uh, one year. It's <laughs> sort of a gun. You can look it up in Good Speed's 1887 history of Tennessee. And apparently that's right. I thought she was just making that one up. Uh, but uh, Crockett got crossways with the with the powers that be. He got crossways with Andy Jackson and and uh, and Polk. Uh, not everybody can get crossways with not one uh, president, but two. And uh, and Crockett did one president and one future president, both from Tennessee. And uh, uh, he stood up for working people and and uh, the people that were trying to come out here and against the land speculators, and didn't make him very popular with a lot of powerful folks and. Uh, uh, so I have a special appreciation for him. Uh, a little book, Cotton Ivy, and I did on Tennessee political humor. We've got a whole chapter of uh, Davy Crockett stories, funny stories by and about Crockett. And uh, his, his actually his last farm, last cabin, where he didn't spend much time, but his family did, uh, was not far from our farm in, uh, uh, in what then was Weekly County, and now it's part of Gibson County. So you mentioned um, I've actually been uh, reading Tennessee political humor. Some of uh, these jokes you voted for <laughs> is the name of the book. Um, and you mentioned Cotton Ivy, who just passed away not too long ago. Uh, tell me a little bit about Cotton Ivy. Lamar's Howard Ivy, nicknamed Cotton because his hair was white when he was a boy. And because who would want to call anybody Lamar's Howard? God bless him. Uh, <laughs> He, he was a wonderful person. Uh, he had ties, uh, deep ties uh, and strong ties uh, right there uh, to the area where Discovery Park is within miles of there. He was the, uh, the Farm Bureau agent there. And uh, after he'd, he had taught ag and uh, uh, had been a university, I mean, excuse me, a school teacher down in Decatur County, his own home area, he wound up with Farm Bureau, wound up there as the agent in O'Brien County. And uh, he was he was making a good living, and uh, as farm bureau agents do. And he decided uh, he was doing speaking and, he, and humor, and decided he wanted to try to make it full time uh, doing that. And he and Pat uh, is now with a wonderful, wonderful woman as well, a uh, great person. Both of them people of deep faith. Uh, he told Pat that's what he wanted to do, and so off he did. He gave up that lucrative job as a farm bureau agent and uh, tried to make it on his own. And the first year uh, he went from making about 60,000 a year to making about $6,000 that first year. And they had four boys at home. And uh, to listen to Cotton tell, he said, now it was kind of a cool wind around there with mama for a while. And, uh, <laughs> but he made it, you know, he, he was a national speaker. He traveled, he, he was not as well known as Jerry Clower, but he wasn't far behind him. Uh, for a stretch and he was as good I thought as Jerry Clower was he was on the Grand Ole Opry he was on uh, Nashville now he was on national television he was on Hee Haw he was on Hee Haw he sure was that's exactly right I don't need to leave that out and uh, he, he was just a wonderful fellow when I got to the legislature he was in the state house at that time his first serving his first his second term was my first term and he gave me a little cassette tape of uh, called Politics and Cotton. It was a performance he'd done of nothing but political humor. And uh, he gave that to me and, and uh, I listened to it and loved it. And, and then I started watching some of the things happening and hearing the stories of things that happened. And, and then I talked to him about doing that book. And uh, I like to say that uh, all of my stories in there are true, but now Cotton's got some lies in there. And we've got a whole <laughs> chapter of his lies in the book. Uh, various characters that he invented and uh, and tales that he told. It's it's a great book, and I've really uh, been um, enjoying it. What what do you think is the role of humor in politics? Humor often is the the grace or the uh, uh, the salve uh, that makes it all work, makes it all possible. Uh, the uh, if you can use humor then you can deflect anger, uh, you can uh, release some tension, uh, and you can uh, make your point. So I think those who, who uh, have humor in their, in their arsenal have a powerful weapon for good. And, and uh, you know, the conflicts are such, uh, uh, they're just inevitable when you 
have strongly felt views on opposing sides. But if people can keep it in perspective and use humor, then it, it makes it possible for us to to keep, uh, I think, a bigger perspective. One of the things humor does is it, uh, it, it'll it whittle you down. I After that book came out, I gave copies to my colleagues in the Senate. And uh, uh, Ron Ramsey, Senator Ron Ramsey, who was a uh, future speaker of the Senate, uh, he uh, came to the floor of the Senate uh, one afternoon and, and claimed that the night before, and, and I believe this really was true, the night before he and some of his colleagues, our colleagues had gone out to a movie. When they came back out, Ron's car had been stolen. And then they found the car the next morning and everything in the car had been taken out of it except our book, uh, Tennessee Book of Humor. He told that on the floor of the Senate. And of course, everybody died laughing and, uh, uh, there were other comments made. Finally, the best I could do uh, on the spot to defend myself was to to explain to the distinguished colleagues in the Senate that I wrote for a higher class of criminal than common car thieves. And uh, <laughs> that's all we went. But the humor, uh, those that kind of laughter takes away some of the partisanship edge and some of the just the friction that builds up when people feel strongly about issues. And uh, I, we need some more people laughing. Uh, at themselves and with each other in uh, in Washington and in Nashville, I think I think we'd all be better off. People would be better served. Well, we're we're definitely um, in one of the most um, divisive eras that we've that we've experienced, both um, in religion and in politics. Um, you've been observing and writing, and I read an op-ed by your son, so I know, uh, you know, this is an area that you've been, uh, your wisdom has been very much valued and appreciated. Um, what do you think is the role of religion um, in politics today? When I was a uh, bill clerk for the Tennessee House of Representatives many years ago, the late Representative Jack Burnett uh, one day was resisting somebody putting an amendment uh, on his legislation. And his argument was this. He said, uh, it's kind of like putting uh, horse apples with ice cream. It, it doesn't hurt the horse apples, but it plays heck on the ice cream. Uh, sometimes when the, uh, the politics comes to the religion, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily hurt the politics, but it, it plays heck on the religion. And unfortunately, I think now we found that it's it's a big mess all the way around, and it hurts both the politics and the religion uh, today. Uh, there's a generation in this country right now that thinks evangelical uh, is another term for the word hater, uh, that it is uh, seen as a particular, uh, it, not as a, a term of faith. Uh, I mean, the, the ancient Greek word, the, the New Testament Greek word, euangelion, uh, means good news. And uh, I consider myself evangelical, always have since I was a teenager, and believe there certainly there's good news. But today, the term evangelical means that's a, a bunch of folks uh, who are haters, that, that hate people who don't look like them or think like them. And there's a generation growing up with that perspective. And it scares me for the future of the church. It scares me for the future of the country. And uh, I think a lot of that is because the church is allowing itself to be used by politicians. And it may be politicians on the right or on the left or, you know, anywhere over the map. But, but uh, as someone once said, uh, when the church gets in bed with the politicians, uh, the, the result is not a happy pregnancy. Absolutely. What, 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 is, what is the way forward? Any, any ideas? Well, I think uh, we've got to let the politician, we've got to make sure the politicians aren't telling the church what the church believes. And and those who are politicians, uh, as a country, we need uh, those politicians listening to a biblically based, uh, faithful church, a, a church that really does take scripture seriously. Uh, there's a whole lot of politics goes on now, and people claim to be uh, people of faith, but they don't look at the scriptures very seriously. They don't take seriously uh, uh, the lessons of the Pentateuch. Uh, uh, I, the, the, you know, the laws that protected the people of Israel 
uh, were laws that protected the poor and the widow and the sojourner and the orphan. I mean, those people who were vulnerable. And and we in Tennessee right now, uh, we don't even want working people to have health insurance. Uh, the the uh, we can get it paid for. It doesn't have to cost the taxpayers anything. In fact, it would relieve pressure on the taxpayers' budgets uh, because the hospitals have said they'll come up with the, the state match. Governor Haslam tried to lead us in that direction. There were leaders in both parties who tried to move us in that direction, but that's not where we're going. And, you know, folks, uh, the folks in the, in the prisons got government health care. Uh, the politicians got government health care. The folks who don't have health care or working people, folks on welfare got it, folks in the prisons got it, uh, folks that are politicians got it, but working people don't have it. And that burn it, we ought to make it affordable. And there's a biblical basis from my perspective. I mean, whatever else you think about Jesus and his miracles, uh, I believe, and I think most of us believe, he healed the sick. And, he, and that's why there are hospitals named Baptist and Methodist and St. Thomas. I mean, that's been the role of the church for generations and uh, and it needs to be we, we need to act on that so working people can pay uh, have the opportunity to pay what they can and and, and ensure their families so their families have a family doctor uh, there's just so much illness out here now and so many people are hurting so badly and it it just kills me to, to have folks come in and come into my law office and and they can't pay their hospital bills, they can't pay the doctor bills they've got, uh, or they put it on the credit cards and they can't pay off the credit cards uh, uh, because they just don't have health insurance. And uh, that's one example. There are plenty of others, uh, but I think a, a biblically based uh, politics uh, that recognizes the widow, the soldier, or the orphan, the poor, and our responsibility to each other uh, certainly I want the church to lead in that. I want the church to do that as much as we can. And then I think uh, we as a people, uh, we as a people of faith in this state uh, need to move forward in, in, in uh, loving our brothers and sisters, all of them. What, what do you say to someone who um, maybe grew up in the church, maybe they grew up in an evangelical church and were evangelical for themselves, or maybe they've never been to church and they have a bad impression of uh, members of the church now. You know, what do you say to them about um, religion and the church, and and how do you explain to them uh, what's been going on? Well, I, the the first thing I do is confess my own shortcomings and sin, or at least I should, if I don't, uh, I fall short every day. And, uh, and I don't know anybody. Uh, I know people walk a lot uh, closer with the Lord than I do, but I don't know anybody that's perfect on this earth. I believe there was one who was, but the rest of us come up short. And so I think we start out with a confession of sin. And then we, we point uh, to the Bible. We point to the new Testament, particularly, to the gospels and teachings of Paul and uh, encourage people to study and, and then point to people that really do live tremendously faithful lives. There are a lot of wonderful godly people in this state and in this country and uh, those lives can be lifted up. And I think we can see, uh, see Jesus in them. There's a story of the late Henry now a Roman Catholic priest and a, and a, a teacher of, uh, of pastoral care and counseling at uh, Yale University Divinity School used to tell. He had a student who came back one time and it had been a student with him. He was very close and the student uh, and he talked and visited and then the, uh, the former student uh, talked and visited and then they fell into the sort of silence that can only exist between kindred souls. And it, after a time, the student, former student said that now in said, when I look into your eyes, it is as though I look into the eyes of Christ. And now and responded, it is the Christ in you who recognizes the Christ in me. And wow. I believe that. I believe that uh, with all my heart. I've, I've seen Christ in people that live much more faithfully than I do and people that have changed their lives and changed my life. And uh, I think it's it's got to be a witness and, it, and we've got to point to those people who really do walk the walk and uh, 
that's that's where people will be uh, persuaded by the lives, not by the not by the stories we uh, the 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 things we say nearly as much as the lives we lead. That gave me chills. <laughs> now a, a, a wonderful writer and a powerful, powerful uh, influence on a whole generation of uh, those of us who went to divinity school. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about your new book that you just released called Faith in Politics, Southern Political Battles, Past and Present. So we'll be right back. Looking for a family-friendly vacation destination? Visit Tennessee for the mountains, the music, rivers, the food, the attractions, and so much more. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning today. I hope you're enjoying Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams. Our guest today is Roy Heron, and we're going to talk about his incredible new book, Faith in Politics, Southern Political Battles, Past and Present. So, Roy, can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to publish this book now? The, uh, I was trying to pull together some of the things that I'd written in part to share with, uh, with my children and with friends. And when we started pulling them together, uh, I realized uh, there were uh, enough published writings that there, there was a book there. And so I contacted UT Press, University of Tennessee Press, to see whether they thought that might be true. And I had a young man who was working with me that summer, and I got him to put it in a good fashion for us and pull them all together. And, uh, and UT Press was interested. And uh, so this, uh, this collection of uh, mostly op-eds, though there are uh, also uh, a few articles and a book review in there with it, uh, it's a collection of writings that have been published over the last uh, 40 years uh, on, uh, on a lot of issues. So Marty Doss, who works here at Discovery Park, um, instead of scribbling all over the books, she writes post-it notes um, and sticks them in here. And so on the very front of this book, she has written, um, Roy's book is a delight to read. It is full of facts, stories, cartoons, wit, and inspiration. He doesn't push his faith at anyone, but it is so evident. If you have um, a pathetic attitude about politics and voting, this will... Um, offer inspiration. I could not put this book down, Marty. So there you go. Um, wow. The best, the best um, um, suggestions, the best word of mouth comes from people that we here at Discovery Park know and love. So that's Marty's recommendation. Um, what are what are some of the highlights in the book that you really hope people uh, pay attention to while they're reading it? When I uh, when I was a young legislator. Uh, Senator Milton Hamilton uh, from Union City was my state senator. And on one of the first trips we took together in the district, uh, he told me, and I never will forget him saying this, he said, Roy, there are no new issues. There's new bills, new legislation, but there's no new issues. And when we started pulling these together and organizing them, I realized just how insightful Senator Hamilton has been. Uh, you know, we're still debating issues uh, of liberty, uh, of life, uh, rights, education, justice, leadership. Those are the six main parts of the book, and and we're still debating debating those things. And within those uh, issues of uh, constitutional freedom and religious liberty, uh, we're debating public safety and uh, health care. Uh, we're debating education. Uh, all the issues uh, seem to come come back around. There's new legislation, but it's the same fundamental issues. Uh, and the uh, the folks at UT Press, the editor there, Scott Damford, was kind enough to uh, he, he's kind enough to be critical, and he doesn't hesitate to let me know when he thinks I I need to do better or do more. And uh, he uh, suggested and showed me how uh, we could add. Uh, portions in front of these essays and uh, uh, articles uh, before and after, before to give it context, after to give an update on 
what's happening today. And so there are uh, there are like 15 intros and 25 postscripts uh, that on these various issues, bringing uh, bringing them right up to today. Now, Marty has written on a post-it note in this book, be sure to read about Howard Baker. So I think your relationship with Howard Baker um, is sort of an antithesis to the Republicans and Democrats today. Tell us a little bit about you and Howard Baker. You know, when I was, uh, I grew up literally down the street from Ned McWhorter. Uh, He was Speaker of the House. I worked for him uh, in Nashville when I was finishing up college at UT Martin. Um, and, and he was my mentor. Um, and I ran for his, uh, his house seat when he ran for governor. One of the things when I was young and full of partisan passion, uh, that I realized was that governor McWhorter, uh, speaker McWhorter, the governor McWhorter, uh, he worked in a bipartisan way. Uh, he tried to help Lamar Alexander be the best governor Lamar Alexander could be. And, and he said, if, if Lamar Alexander succeeds, Tennessee succeeds. So that was what he tried to do as the Speaker of the House. And then when he was working as governor, uh, he worked with, uh, with everybody in both parties, anybody that would work with him, he would work with them. And uh, one of the people that uh, I think exemplified that on the Republican side of the aisle was Howard Baker. And a few years ago, had the opportunity to read, a, I think, the first real book-length biography of uh, Howard Baker and uh, wrote a book review of it. And that book review is, is in here. Uh, Howard Baker is, is one of my heroes, uh, just like Ned McWhorter is. Uh, I think they both understood that what was doing right by the country, doing right by the state, was what you're really supposed to be about. You run in, as a member of a particular political party. And there are times a few issues come along and they're, and they're partisan. But the vast majority of the time, Scott, while I was in the General Assembly, uh, 80 or 90 percent of the years I was in the General Assembly, uh, it, it was not, it, it just wasn't partisan. And 98 uh, percent of the issues weren't partisan. There might be two or three issues a year that would break on a partisan basis. Uh, for years and years, it was that way. And I, when I needed votes on an issue, try to pass a good bill or stop a bad one. Uh, I didn't worry about whether it was a Democrat or Republican I was going to. And quite frankly, as a Democrat, it was often easier for me to get along with my Republican colleagues because we weren't fighting over the same committee assignments or, or leadership positions. Uh, and uh, we did. And Tennessee's had a history of that that I think has served us awfully, awfully well. And uh, right now, this, this nation and the state seems to me have have gone to extremes and gone, uh, the, the Democrats can't get left enough and the Republicans can't get right enough and there's nobody left in the middle. It seems like at least, at least there's a not, not enough. And I, I, I thought the way you got down the road was by staying on the road, not going into either ditch. So what, for those, for those of us, you know, who are not uh, in office and who watch Fox or CNN or, or whatever, read the New York Times or, you know, liberal publications, conservative publications. What, what, what's your uh, suggestion for regular folks who are saying, I don't pay attention to any of it anymore? I talk to so many people these days who don't watch the news, who don't read the newspaper, who are just so turned off by the whole thing. Um, any thoughts for those folks out there? Well, I certainly sympathize uh, and empathize with those folks uh, who are so turned off by it. Uh, I, I watch it all, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, sometimes when it gives me indigestion, <laughs> sometimes when it doesn't. But, uh, but I, I try to make sure that I don't get stuck on one network or one channel. I, I still believe in, in the journalists that I know, uh, including those that used to, you know, carve me up on occasion. Uh, the vast majority of journalists that I've encountered uh, are people of integrity trying to do a very hard job uh, and trying to get it right. Uh, sometimes we'd have uh, uh, vigorous discussions, you know, where I thought they might not have gotten it right. But they're, for the most part, they're trying to take a, an issue that uh, you could write, you know, tens of thousands of words about, and they're trying to get it down into a few hundred word, hundred words. And so that's, that, that's, 
that's really hard uh, as a as a writer. Uh, I, I admire those people who have to do it on deadline. Uh, I, I have a hard time doing it even when I'm not on a tight deadline and when I've got days and weeks to do it. Uh, I think the vast majority of the media are trying to do it right. I worry that we've now gotten segmented so that if, you know, if, if you want to make money and uh, with audience shares, uh, you go, uh, if, you, if you go to the left with the MSNBC and you go to the right with Fox and, and now even those uh, folks are getting more extreme because there are people further to the left and further to the right. Uh, so we just keep moving to the, to the ends of the earth, it seems like. The vast majority of the, of the working journalists, not the talking heads, but the working journalists who write the news stories, I think are trying to get it right. And uh, I, I would encourage folks to you know, keep reading, <laughs> particularly keep reading. And uh, not just, I don't mean the internet stuff, but I mean, I think the, the news and read all the, the news sources you can, different news sources, different perspectives. Uh, I think the Wall Street Journal does a fabulous job on its news page. Now, sometimes their editorial pages I agree with, and sometimes I don't. But uh, there are a lot of good journalists out there right now that are trying to get it right. And I think we just got to, we've got to be discerning. We've got to be critical. We've got, we should be. Um, but I, I worry that uh, when we start getting our news off of what somebody says, somebody said, somebody said with no sources and, and it's, it's uh, on Facebook, then I worry that what that does for us. And uh, right now that, uh, that so many people uh, believe that the last presidential election was stolen when, uh, when Republican secretaries of state in Georgia, Arizona, uh, you know, other states are saying we did it right and we did it fair. And it, you know, it, may, it wasn't the way that we wanted it to turn out, but this is the truth. I worry that people are reading stuff online and, uh, and they're misled about that. Uh, I, that, that scares me for the future of the Republic. Absolutely. Me too. Um, before we go, and first of all, this has been an incredible time I've gotten to spend with you. But before we go, I do want to mention uh, Things Held Dear, Soul Stories for My Son. So you have um, uh, three sons. Uh, tell us a little bit about the inspiration for Things Held Dear. When I was, uh, when Nancy's, Nancy and I were blessed with uh, the twins and then uh, the little one uh, who uh, came along three years later, he spent his life trying to be a triplet. Uh, uh, and uh, with those three boys, uh, I wanted them to know some of the stories that, that meant the most to me, that had taught me the most and that uh, told about the people of, of our region. Uh, I, words, I, I don't have the words to describe what a blessing it was uh, to grow up in, in West Tennessee and with the people that loved me and cared for me and corrected me and uh, inspired me and, and just blessed me day to day. And so the uh, Thanks Hell Dear is a collection of 10 stories about growing up in West Tennessee. Uh, it starts out with a story about my father uh, and most of that story is about him uh, and my mother before I was even born. Uh, he served in World War II. Uh, he was uh, a father in his 30s with two children. When he was drafted, he was among those last to be drafted. Uh, he went in after D-Day, but into, the, into France, fought across France and into Belgium, and then was severely wounded and almost died. He spent 10 months in army hospitals in England and in this country, and from 1944 until he died in 1977. Every moment that he was awake, his legs felt like they were on fire. Uh, so severe were the wounds from the mortar shell that landed right next to him. And uh, it's a story about him and mom. And uh, they, they hear on the radio about Pearl Harbor as they're on uh, Sunday afternoons, they're driving from Greenfield back over to Dresden. Uh, and then he gets drafted, goes off, and then uh, their saga uh, during all of that. And he fought his way back, came home uh, in, either in a wheelchair or on crutches. Uh, I remember him as a little boy walking with two canes and then one cane. And by the end of his life, 
Uh, he had special orthopedic shoes. A lot of people, if they didn't look at his feet, had no idea that he'd ever been in the war. Uh, he was he was my hero, and uh, and uh, set 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 an example then uh, that inspires me still. Uh, the book end of that is a story about uh, I call Mother Love, and it's about my mother who was the most loving person I uh, ever knew, and uh, uh, she was just unbelievable. The only person I admire more than my father for what he went through and the courage and strength that it took for him to do it. The only person I admire more than him is my mother who had to live through that and through the suffering, bad suffering and, uh, and a whole lot more. And in between those uh, stories uh, are stories about uh, uh, farming and uh, sports and uh, the things that make up life here in, in West Tennessee, including our faith. And it's a bit of a, there's a chapter about, uh, about our faith. Uh, so that's, that's what Things Held Dear is about. If anybody should be so gracious as to want a copy, uh, we can sure get them one if they'll just uh, reach out to us in Dresden, uh, either RoyHeron.com or, or uh, call us in Dresden. There's only uh, uh, all the Herons in, in, uh, in Weekly County, I guess, are either my wife or me or our office. Uh, <laughs> Well, and you talk. The book also includes uh, stories about Sonny Cochran, Fats mm. Donaldson. You know, people that, or I'm sorry, Fats Everett. Uh, people, people that we around here would uh, recognize. Uh, Mike Cox is in the book. So, um, anyway, it's a great book. I loved reading it, um, yeah. and Thanks. highly I, recommend I, it. I love. Uh, there's a chapter about growing up with hunting and shooting, and, and most of that's at Real Foot, and uh, that place is, uh, has been a huge part in in my family's life and in my life. So it's about our part of the world in West Tennessee. The whole, the whole book is. Well, thank you for writing it and capturing all that um, so that uh, it will be preserved for future generations. Now, before I go, I also want to ask you, did you ever uh, meet Robert Kirkland? When Robert was getting started with that idea, he uh, called some of us together. I remember Congressman Tanner was there and represented Pinion and myself. And, uh, and I remember we had a meeting about it before, you know, before any ground had been broken. And uh, quite frankly, uh, let me just confess straight up. I, I thought, I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know about this. You know, he was, he was always so much smarter than I was and, uh, and so much more visionary than I was. And uh, thank God he was, I, you know, what a great, thing y'all are doing and what a great asset to our part of the world uh, so I, uh, I'm, I'm, I may have been slow to believe but I am a believer so any way I can be supportive of y'all please don't hesitate to let me know awesome we really appreciate that Thanks to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.